Um, so uh, uh, the theme is uh, future directions, and I'm actually a bit uh, afraid to be talking about future directions because I don't, don't really know. But what I'm going to do is um, talk a little bit about the chapter in uh, the book. It's a, really about a framework for how to think about whole earth carbon cycling. And then I'll end with uh, thinking about um, you know, where, where does that lead us next. Um, so I, I put this up. This is a, uh, strat, uh, some st stratigraphy right here. It's the Eagle Ferd out in West Texas. And it's basically, these are marls. These are carbonates all up and down here. Um, but it also happens to be very rich in organic carbon. Uh, and this is where um, uh, they're fracking out there to get natural gas and uh, um, other hydrocarbons. But I also want to point out that all of these little brown layers, these are volcanic ash. And so the volcanic ash is, is strongly coupled with the deposition uh, of, of these sediments here. And you can kind of think of this carbon that's sequestered here as lime, limestones and organic carbon as they were once in volcanoes. Um, so there's, there's the link um, right there. So, whoops, I thought I heard. Yeah, that is the top. It's not, not advancing. Oh, it worked, okay. I wasn't pressing hard enough, okay. So, uh, you know, why would we be interested in sort of whole earth carbon cycling? Oops, it worked too well. Uh, that's, that's weird. I don't know. Oh, go back one, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so right up here, this is uh, oxygen isotopic compositions of carbonates through, through time. It's uh, a proxy for temperature. And you can see over the last 70 million years, it was a greenhouse climate, and it gradually cooled down, and now we're in basically an ice house climate. And what causes that, of course, there's albedo um, and, and, and solar insulation. But if you look at PCO2 in the atmosphere, you can see that overall there's been a decline. So in large part, on uh, these long time scales, at least within the Phanerozoic, what controls uh, climate is how much CO2 um, is in the atmosphere. Next slide. Oh, here. And of course, you probably have seen many slides like this so f in this session. It's really all about the inputs and outputs of CO2 that control how much uh, CO2 is in the atmosphere. And there's, there's, of course, all the deep mantle contributions, metamorphic degassing. And then you have silicate weathering and the eventual precipitation of carbonate. And I, I don't actually, want, I'm not going to go through this, uh, but this is just to show it's a plot where the y axis gives you residence time of carbon in particular reservoirs. There's nothing on this axis right here. Uh, residence time roughly scales with all the size of the reservoir in terms of total carbon. And you can th think of the Earth as having an uh, exogenic carbon system here, which would be the biosphere, oceans, and atmospheres. You can get as complicated as you want, all the different components of the exogenic system. That system uh, basically sits on top of the endogenic system, where you have the, the mantle contributing through mid-ocean ridges and other types of volcanism into this big box right here. You can have storage on the continental crust and lithosphere, or the oceanic lithosphere. And of course, if you subduct carbon, it goes back into the mantle. And these work at much shorter timescales, you know, on the uh, timescale of days to thousands of years. And the deep carbon cycle works on much longer. We're talking 100,000 to million year uh, timescales. And so when we think about whole Earth carbon cycles, you have to make sure what timescales we're worried about. And so for, for us, I'm, that whole thing, uh, at least Today's talk simplifies to something like this. Mantle and ex exogenic carbon, ocean, atmosphere, biosphere here. And then some temporary storage sites. As the continents build up, you, you deposit carbonate and organic carbon on them. Some of them can get back into the mantle when they weather and then get subducted and, and so forth. Um, and so what we're interested in um, is how much carbon is in here, which ultimately then dictates how much CO2 might be in the atmosphere over the long time scales. Um, and, and so just some pictures here. Again, this, these, this is an example of the sink. 
and these are the inputs. I, I had to put this up here. It's Odonyo Lengai, and last year I flew over it and circled around it. So not that this guy is that important for the long-term carbon cycle, but it's, it's very nice. Um, so we know a lot about the inputs, or we, we, at least we understand its volcanism and metamorphism. I don't know how much has been talked about in terms of weathering or here, but the weathering um, goes as follows. It, the idea is um, if you have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, it um, uh, generates carbonic acid, reacts with your calc silicates, and eventually breaks it down, and then which, you, know, you skip a lot of steps here, and eventually uh, precipitates that carbonate, uh, carbon back down as carbonate limestones on the continental shelves. Okay? And the idea is that the more CO2 you have, the chances are you're going to increase temperature, which increases kinetics. It might increase H2O runoff or precipitation. All of these things increase chemical weathering, which then increases CO2 drawdown, which then uh, pulls out carbonate. So this is uh, pulls down CO2 by sequestering the carbon as carbonate. This is a negative feedback. And it's good that we have this negative feedback, because if we didn't have that, just this background uh, release of CO2 from volcanism would just keep on going, and we'd reach a runaway state. So Earth is basically the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Think of it as a bathtub right here of water here. These are the inputs, and there's a sink here that actually depends on how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. The more you have in it, uh, the, the more that will come out to first order. It's a lot more complicated than that, but you can just a simple differential equation here. And so uh, the, these are the magnitudes of your inputs, and what comes out, really you need to be thinking about the efficiency, which is this rate constant here of how it comes out. And that's really, that efficiency has something to do with tectonics, the amount of CO2, and, then, and temperature, uh, and also life there. Now, if you set this equal to zero to figure out what it might be at steady state, then the steady state CO2 is basically inputs divided by this efficiency factor. So you can increase CO2 either by more mantle degassing or uh, decreasing efficiency of, of weathering. And the time scale for this, the, the steady state time, or the residence uh, time, response time, is one over K. And what this, is, uh, this number is is basically if you were to perturb that system, how long does it take for the Earth uh, ex exogenic system to get back to a steady state where inputs and outputs are roughly equal? Um, and how do we know that? Well, we can, one way to do that is if you know how much you have in the reservoir or what's coming out, you can get it that way by dividing them. Another way is the community has used things like this at the PETN 55 million years ago. There was a spike in uh, CO2. Uh, as recorded by in the carbon isotopic compositions, and they look at this, uh, this response time, and from that you can, they conclude it's going to be somewhere in the tens to 100,000 year time scales. So that's important to know. So as long as we're beyond 100,000 100, year time scales or so, uh, the system is at steady state, which means inputs and outputs are roughly um, equal. And this is, of course, just a compilation of a lot of uh, people's work, and these are uh, uh, the inputs of C the long term geologic inputs of CO2, metamorphism, all the mantle, the magmatism right here. And what you have to compare it to is the silicate weathering right here, which is the carbonate deposition basically, um, organic carbon effect, and then also the amount of carbonate that is uh, sequestered directly in oceanic crust through that type of weathering. Weathering of carbonates um, on long time scale just balances out, so that's why they're on both sides. But if you can sum all these and these, there are big error bars, but <laughs> to within order of magnitude, they are roughly balanced. And so what I want to say is uh, when you're thinking about long time scales, um, everything is balanced. And the only way then to change the CO2, um, next slide, please. Um, Next slide. This somehow doesn't work now. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, and the, it's just that it's the, change, the changes in inputs and these um, efficiencies. Okay, so then the question, I think, in the community right now is change the inputs and the efficiencies. Well, which one is causing it? Are we changing volcanism or are we changing the efficiencies? And the way it works here is very simple. The slope of this line is basically just k right here, 
And if you want to increase the amount of CO2, one way to do it without changing efficiencies of uh, withdrawal is just to increase the inputs. And so for a long time, we've been thinking about, well, you just have more rapid oceanic spreading, and that drove the Cretaceous uh, greenhouse. But you could also have, if you go to the right one, a scenario where you don't change inputs at all, or even outputs, right? We're at steady state. But what you do is you change the efficiencies, or effectively the residence time of carbon in the exogenic system, and you make it less efficient. That could be, have something to do with maybe less uh, mountains being formed or less land is available. Many factors could have changed this. But the, the debate right now is essentially on which one these are. So I'm going to show you just some examples. I don't think we really know the answer. But um, this is, uh, we'll be talking about the, the inputs of CO2. Like I said, the, the, the ideas have been, for the most part, mid-ocean ridges are changing through time. But in the last sort of 10 years, we've started to think about other things. One of them, in particular, is these volcanic arcs. We think of them typically as static, uh, sort of continuous geologic features. But they can wax and wane, particularly in terms of the style of subduction. So you can have island arcs and continental arcs. And we heard, I think, some talks today where if you have magmas intruding through um, upper plate that's continental crust, there's a lot of carbon within the crust itself, and it can liberate that. So this is just showing you there are, there are times in Earth's history where many of the arcs were actually ocean continent uh, arcs. And so this is the Cretaceous, and you could potentially liberate lots of carbon out to the continents that were stored over there over hundreds of millions of years before and then suddenly released when you reach a state uh, like this. Uh, more recently, it's, there's been suggested by uh, this from Dietmar Muller's group, uh, but based on uh, work by Tobias Fischer's, were inspired by that, where the diffuse degassing in some of these continental rifts may be very, very high. And so if you have a, a period where you have a lot of continental breakup, then that could also enhance CO2. And in fact, when you have breakup, you also have these continental arcs, so they could go hand in hand uh, together. Um, and this here, just this going back to the idea of these continental arcs uh, forming, I have these uh, brick-like uh, features here. Those are all um, these carbonate platforms that were pre-existing there before these arcs came in. And uh, you can see this is showing you the length of the, the arcs along with uh, zircon ages through time. And so there's a rough um, uh, correlation there. So not saying that that is uh, cause, causation, but it's uh, a hint that maybe this sort of stuff actually happens. And the, the end product, of course, of magmas interacting with carbonates is to get this decarbonation. And you, you have these residues called scarns. And sometimes they're very beautiful. This, these, these are ancient. Um, uh, sediments here, but they're now peroxnite, garnetites, and, and so forth like that. Um, of course, they, uh, these magmatic origins are getting uh, more complicated. Of course, every time we dig deeper, things get more complicated. Uh, while they do produce a lot of CO2, so this is a plot of, of magmatic flux versus time for one of, an, an arc in the Cretaceous, uh, Western North America. It comes up, and then it, it dies. Um, and they're producing a lot of CO2, but they can also become regional sinks of CO2 because you, you generate high elevations, you generate your own orographic precipitation, uh, a lot of erosion, and so chemical weathering rates could uh, be enhanced, and so your, your net global efficiency of weathering could get higher. And what that might do is take you from a situation right here where, you, yes, you increase CO2 uh, fluxing, increase CO2 in the atmosphere, that'll give you a greenhouse state, but in the aftermath, when the magmatism ends, you still have this mountain that's coming down, uh, which is uh, magmatically dead. But the efficiency of weathering is much higher. And so the net result is when you go back down, you actually go to lower CO2 concentrations. So you might predict that when you have these magmatic origins, a greenhouse, and then immediately after that, you would go into ice house uh, states if there are these global fluctuations in tectonics. So. The, uh, this was the, the sort of Walker feedback. What you have to superimpose on that is put a box around that, but these are the drivers, the deep earth sort of winds in the end. And we've largely thought about as tectonics, driving uplift and erosion, chemical weathering, but tectonics also includes not just metamorphism, but a lot of these mountain belts actually have a lot of magmatism. And right now we think mostly about Tibet uh, as our orogeny, 
but Tibet doesn't have a lot of magmatism, but in the past, much of the mag uh, orogenic belts were continental arcs, and those are magmatic. So now it becomes an interesting interplay between the role of tectonics in generating or enhancing CO2 fluxing and also enhancing erosion. So I think we have to look at those in great detail in the future. The other thing we need to uh, uh, talk about is that carbon cycling is, is not, uh, we, you know, you can't look at it by itself. We had talks uh, earlier today and also I think from the titles uh, early in the week. Of course, carbon is, we think mostly about depositing as carbonate, but 20% of it is deposited as organic carbon. And where you put that organic carbon, the oceans and the carbonate matters a lot. If they are deposited together, it doesn't, for example, it doesn't change you know, net oxidation states, but they're deposited in different areas and it can very well happen, um, as uh, shown in some of Terry Plank's work, then you can have a lot of effects in terms of, of the type of species of carbon that you're putting down. And of course, this uh, deposition of organic carbon is tied to the oxygen cycle uh, today. So if you want to understand how we got um, atmospheric oxygenation, it is fundamentally linked to the uh, evolution of carbon, how we cycle it throughout Earth's history. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the car oxygen thing. I want to come back to, to this right here and um, the, the role of the volcanism here. So this Eagleford strata, I also plot on at about the same time, all these black things right here, these are basically source rocks. And so uh, Cretaceous source rocks, they're one of the major reservoirs for uh, the hydrocarbons that we, um, are we get out today. But they're in the Cretaceous, and they happen to be associated with, at least in time, a massive global flare-up in continental arc volcanism. And, and then, like I said, every one of these recessed layers, almost every one of them is a volcanic ash, and so we're over here, and they're coming from this arc, they kind of drift eastward. And here's, here's a, a big uh, ash layer um, that's recessed uh, right there. So what is, the, is, is there a coupling between volcanism and this deposition of organic carbon? So one can look at these ash layers in great detail. What we did here is they're highly altered, and what we wanted to see is what the original compositions were, and then um, what happened to them uh, after they were erupted and deposited into the ocean, uh, how did their compositions change? So what uh, this is, is really a recon kind of using a certain immobile elements to reconstruct the protolith composition. And then from that, we can actually, so you, if you look at the red colored guys right here, the black ones are the protoliths, uh, and the red ones are all the altered ashes, and anything lying below that tells you that it's lost, in this case, silica, a lot of silica. So we can calculate how much silica, phosphorus, iron, all of these elements that are potential nutrients uh, for life, how much was lost, and we can calculate a flux of this nutri of, uh, nutrient deposition from volcanoes, airborne uh, inputs, into this interior seaway. And so this is what we get and in terramoles per year, the soluble fraction of phosphorus, iron, and silica, the red ones, in the Cretaceous, and you can compare it to global uh, inputs of phosphorus, or, or soluble phosphorus and iron from rivers or wind and so forth. And what you can see is, during these periods of very high volcanic activity, uh, the silica is, I mean, the volcanoes dominate the silica. Phosphorus is pretty big. It's comparable to even just modern um, uh, wind-blown uh, nutrient delivery. And iron is, of course, much higher. And so the idea is that it's possible that this the volcanism is actually uh, fertilizing the oceans and um, enhancing biological productivity, which then may even lead to this uh, organic carbon uh, burial. Um, so the other thing, uh, because we can reconstruct the compositions of these ashes, we, um, we can actually, so this is work from Sidney Allen, who's working with some uh, collaborators, Daniel Minnesini from Shell. This is silica content, the original silica content of the ash, this volcano through time. And I, this is 97 to 90 million years. Uh, that we have an age resolution that's, that is phenomenal because there are, there are no uh, erosional unconformities in this sediment, um, except where this bug happens to be. But the, uh, and it, 
the, the ages are bracketed by a high precision uranium lead, and then there's Milankovitch cycle. So you have uh, age resolution uh, on the time scales of tens to 100,000 years. And so what you can see here is the composition of the, the arc of what's erupted is actually changing um, through time. Okay. And this is, I don't think this has ever been seen before at this uh, level of resolution. So, and we haven't published this, so just uh, uh, forget about it after this, this talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can remember the caterpillar uh, there. And <clears throat> but you know, what does this have to do with carbon, of course? Um, so I'm not sure, but what it's telling you is something's happening with the plumbing system of the arc on basically million year time scales. It's, it's changing. And we learned earlier from Liz Cottrell's talk, of course, CO2 solubility was very dependent on pressure. This is telling you where magmas are probably ponding. Uh, they're changing the depths of which they're ponding. So it's basically telling you that an arc itself over million year time scales, probably this, the effect is the CO2 coming out is going to change, among other things, not just CO2, but so many other things become uh, interesting in here, sulfur, uh, water, um, et cetera. So I don't know what's driving this, but some hints may come from some simple diagrams like this. This was a student, Farner, who plotted the composition of volcanic rocks versus uh, elevation in arcs. And you go, why would we do that? Well, the idea was that elevation, in most places, is isostatically compensated, so it's a measure of crustal thickness. And you see this, this correlation. So the fact that uh, silicon content varies with crustal thickness is also telling you that the average pressures of magmatic differentiation are changing. So is it possible that what we just saw in the previous figure is that your arc is waxing and waning in crustal thickness, or maybe stress state, and the end product is it's going to really change the way we think about how volatiles get out of arcs. So what we see today is a snapshot, but uh, these arcs are not static. Not, they're not even static on you know, 100 million time scales, but on these million year time scales, they're also not um, static. Um, so I guess that's, that's it. I think with uh, deep carbon, I, uh, I tried to get across that carbon links to so many other things, this, uh, nutrient cycling and if we really want to understand how uh, the carbon fits within the, the system, we have to think about uh, tectonics, climate, and life. Yeah, thanks. We could do a very quick question if anyone's got one for Cinti. No? Yep, okay. Hi, I'm just wondering. Um, so you have this variation in silica content, but a lot of volcanoes have, you know, the, the different sources of magma, either mafic or calcic. Oh, yeah. So is this, are these ash layers all from the same volcano? Um, or wh what's special, oh. I guess, about having some that yeah. are silica rich and poor? We, we, we still don't know the answer. Each one of these ash layers is probably from one single eruption. So, and whether those eruptions come from the same vents, I don't know, probably not. Um, and um, of course, any uh, uh, volcano will have a whole range of compositions, and any section of an arc will have a whole range. But what we're seeing is when we, that uh, correlation with um, elevation, it's an average. And with the ashes, they're definitely discrete volcanoes. Um, so we're making a jump, of course, comparing it to averages. But in, in any case, it's very, Interesting that we see that variation. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, thanks. <laughs>